so today we're going to talk about survival analysis. Uh, so this chapter, just as a preview of where the chapter goes, that I, I will not go, uh, there's an, an interesting section on shrinkage methods in, in survival analysis that I won't cover. Uh, trying to chapter, uh, just, uh, I think it's like 13 point, or I, I don't know, it's, it's one of the subsections of this chapter. Um, so it's not going to be mentioned. So I'm going to focus on the main inferential methods. So uh, yeah, the main inferential methods in survival analysis today. So the first of those is the log rank test. Um, so just, just as a kind of reminder of where we were and a look towards where we're going. Um, in the last session, we looked at these things called uh, Kaplan-Meier curves and we looked at how they were constructed. And one thing we haven't talked about yet is um, how we would, so, so say that, for example, um, the next case is gonna be a little, a little better. Uh, so say we wanna make an inference about whether or not the positive or negative result. So whether or not there's a difference in the survival of, of these two different, you could consider the populations. And, and by the way, these are, uh, this, these two survival curves are the, you can see on the uh, y-axis, the probability of not being published. So, so here death is being published, being alive, again, using the, the medical terminology from last week is not having been published yet. Uh, time is in, in months. And these were, these were, what were these studies? I don't know, if, if, I, if I try to be specific, I'm gonna be wrong. But the point is that uh, some of these studies had a positive result and some had a negative result. And you can imagine this also being uh, two different groups and being treatment versus control, right? And in that case, you really do wanna see that bivariate comparison, right? You just wanna see if you're a medical researcher, a clinical researcher, you want to see whether or not the survival curves are different for the two groups. So how would we do that? So in the book, they, they point out, you know, um, you might think, oh, we can just do a point estimate and a, uh, a, a two sample T test, right? On mean survival time for the two groups. Um, so it'd be nice. And the, the issue is that if they're censoring, um, that's not going to be possible. So what to do in the, in the presence of censoring? Uh, oh, before I, before I, I, I say this, I will say, uh, I don't know if it exists in the survival package in R, um, but you can compare point estimates uh, for survival times at specific moments in this lifelines package that's in Python, but we can't talk about Python. It's not, not allowed in this, in this uh, this R universe, uh, but in, in R, uh, I know it's at least it's very easy, and it's this is like the traditional thing to do is to not compare any point estimates. So, say, is the survival of group A and group B different at a given time? So, I don't know the a five year survival rate, for example. The traditional thing to do, or the thing that at least is pedagogically always mentioned first, I found is just comparing this null, hy well, testing the null hypothesis that the two survival curves, so here, well, there's a group A and there's a group B, that the two survival cur curves are uh, statistically indistinguishable. And so like, you know, to me, at least that's a, a question that's not one that I normally think about, I'm just comparing entire distributions. That's, um, I don't know, I'd be interested to know if, if any of you do work where you're comparing distributions. I know I have seen it done, but, um, and it's just, in, anyway, in, in the social sciences, I've really, I've not seen this happen and feel free to interrupt at any moment. But, um, so, so we're gonna be doing this, this log rank test, um, which will compare groups uh, and groups are often called strata in this case. Um, so, um, just as a, another thing to mention, this is, it's like a 
it has parallels with t-test and ANOVA in the sense that you can compare two groups, like a t-test. You can compare whether or not there's a difference among a bunch of groups, like ANOVA. But as, as in ANOVA, you don't know which group is the different one. And you can also do a bunch of, of course, if you can do one pairwise test, you can do a bunch of pairwise tests. Um, so in that way, it's, it's similar to things that you're probably familiar with. Um, so I'm not, I don't know how much light I can shed. So on this, uh, so I don't know how much time I'll spend on it, but the idea is that at any given time, um, that someone, someone dies. So that again, this dying could be less more, it could be someone publishes. So, um, from the terminology of last week, I'll have you remember that anytime there's a, a fall in one of the two lines, uh, in either of the two lines, um, that is, uh, is denoted as D sub K. So where, where K is just an index of these sequential moments. And yeah, so yeah, that's that. So D is that. So, so there, that's what the subscript K is doing. Q is the number of people that died at time K. And so survival is just the, well, no. So the risk group, so I guess I can make little things here for you guys. Um, so R1, yeah, this is going to be a subscript. Let's, let's do let's do marginals first. So this would be the entire risk group at the moment when a drop-off happens. Um, but there are two groups here. So you could have, you can partition the at-risk group into those at risk, uh, the population, not the population, the members of the sample at risk in group one, the members of the, pop, the sample at risk in group two. So that's what the first subscript is doing. Um, and then Q again is the people who, for whom the event or the units for whom the event, for which the event happened. Um, and then you, again, we can break that down into the two groups and survived is just the risk minus those who are at risk minus the ones who, uh, for whom the event happened. So, so we have this table um, again, for each of those moments, for each of those K moments. And, um, and, and this is the part where I'm not sure that um, I'm, I'm gonna be able to be super helpful, but the idea um, is that we can construct a statistic where we have <clears throat> something that's very familiar to us. So, so this W part, this, uh, this first part, is just a schematic. I mean, that's something that, you know, if you've ever calculated a z-score or t-score, um, you, you've seen that. So the observed value minus the expected value over the standard uh, deviation variable under the null hypothesis. Um, so, so the idea is that you know, with, with that common format, we're going to construct a statistic here. So what would we expect under the null hypothesis? What would uh, Q1 be? So the number, again, that's the number of people at risk in group one who die at time K. Uh, what would we expect it to be? Well, we would expect it to be just the proportion of the sample that is in group one. So again, so let's say if it's, let's say it's half and half, uh, you know, then R1 would be R1 at time K. Uh, if it's, if, well, we'll say, it's, yeah, before the time K it was half and half. Could have been different than half and half when the study started. Anyway, at time K, we'll say it was half and half. So this would be, you know, half of RK. So it'd be 0.5. And then QK would be the numbers who dropped off. And so we'd expect, yeah, it to be half. I think that that part's clear enough. Um, and then things become a little less, a little less clear. So X um, is just going to be the sum over all the different moments. Um, and then, and then things become a bit weird for me. I don't know if any of you have 
read the chapter or have insights about this. Um, I'm going to kind of breeze through this because I have things that I can't explain. Where we get we calculate W. So again, so this was the schematic up here, and then how it's actually realized in this case is um, that for each of the k moments, we subtract the observed number that for for which the event happened in group one from the expected, uh, and then we have this this variance, which is just a an addition of the variances at all the moments, and then take the square root. Um, and so, and, and it makes sense that this would be, so regarding the comment below that uh, when sample size is large, um, the log rank statistic W has an approximately standard normal distribution. So that I mean, makes sense because again, that is how you do a Z score. Now, the weird thing about it is that it also kind of looks like uh, a chi-square a little bit in that we're subtracting off expect at each moment. So I don't know how, how much you, you all remember the chi-square situation, but, but what you do there is for each cell, basically, you um, subtract the expected from the observed, and then you square it, and then you divide by the expected. Uh, so it's a, a different thing, um, but it's also, well, the reason I, I bring it up is because it's similar. And sure enough, when you do this in code, oh, since I, I realized that we're probably not going to have a lab for this, so I decided to incorporate a little bit of code uh, in this. So um, when, when you do this, actually, so this is the publication data from ISLR2, the ISLR2 library package. Um, you you run this test and you actually do, it reports a, a chi-square test. Um, so I don't quite understand. And, and again, in the book, they're talking about having a standard normal distribution um, and we're not getting a p-value from, from a normal, we're getting it from a chi-square. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that. Um, so are you musing on the difference between the chi-squared test and this other test statistic that's being constructed? I am musing on that, yeah. I'm using, yeah. So, so I mean, because this is the one the book presents. This is the one the book foregrounds. But then if you look at the package the book uses to do the lab, for example, this, this is from the survival package. And it's also the, the package that, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think John might know this, that uh, the tidy models uses as their engine so far for, for sensor regression and uh, proportional hazards models. Uh, anyway, it, like this is the, the test statistic that's presented. Anyway, so yes, I am using on that a little bit. But um, I mean, it's not something that we have to, we have to resolve. Um, and I guess while, while I'm on that subject a little bit, so I started to do the lab and I was doing it in tidy models. And it seems like so far, in case you need to do a, a, a censored regression model or uh, survival analysis in tidy models right now, it seems like it's not fully supported uh, yet. In, at least it's not supported in the normal way that most models are supported. And I think it has something to do with the fact that these models are always constructed with these uh, inline functions that are not allowed in tidy models. So we always regress uh, a like this survival object onto the covariates where we sort of bind together. It's kind of like how sometimes you'll use CBind for a binomial regression uh, where you bind together, in this case, the, the time and the, the status indicator, which was something we talked about last week, that there'll be a, a column in your data that has zeros and ones. And again, it changes depending on the, the software, but the one can either indicate that it was uh, Y was observed, or it can indicate that truncation or censoring was observed in any case. Um, so this is how you do a log rank test in, in survival. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, not just yeah. They they're not done yet <laughs> with with survival and tidy models. Um looking at this package, it looks like um Emil Havitfelt is now the maintainer of this package. 
he just got hired by our studio relative. I mean, it could have been a year now. I don't know. Relatively recently. Um, and he's the same guy who did the tidy models labs for ISLR. So uh, actually, I haven't checked if he has updated the ISLR, um, you know, the, the labs for this chapter. Um, as he's working on that package, but eventually I'll bet the ISLR lab. Um, yeah, there it is. It's, he says, um, he, in the lab, his notes on the lab, he says it's being worked on, but not implemented. So I'll bet as part of his development of the package, he'll update the notes at some point, just after we're done. All right. For future cohorts. Yes. What a time to be alive. <laughs> um, and it's funny because the link is to the link is broken. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's in flux. Yeah. Um. So 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 this was this is one reason why I didn't. Uh, this I, I I don't know if this happens to any of you. So so they mentioned uh, that. So anyway, so basically, what happened last night as I was finishing up these notes is. Um, you know, it was getting kind of kind of late, so I needed to be efficacious with my time. And I realized, okay, here they're talking about normal distributions. Here that I see that it's a chi-square distribution. And they mentioned permutations, so I decided to spend precious time making doing the permutations. So um, anyway, I mean, it's actually it's actually very easy, but uh, still, on principle, I probably shouldn't have done it. Um, so just real quick, this is, uh, I mean, they mentioned this in the book as a, a way to do this um, non-parametrically. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I don't need to go over this code for you all. I mean, it's just, it's just as, a, as a, you can see, I titled the, the variable garbled positive result. So again, positive result was the, uh, was the stratifying variable that we're looking at in this case. Um, so if you, I can not change slides. Oh, all right, I'll fix that in a second. Um, so anyway, so basically I created a thousand uh, permutations of that, each of the size of the data set, and uh, then got the observed difference and then used those to create, uh, use the garbled ones, uh, the permuted ones. I might as well just say the word that is correct. Um, to create the null distribution, and uh, and and that's what what you get. And so I was really proud of this. Every time this happens, I'm pretty proud. So the the p value that I calculate is I don't know if you all can see this. I, mean, I can zoom in. Why not take advantage of this? So I get a p of sorry of uh, 0 0.361 in the text. Uh, that is exactly what they got. So so that was nice. Um, to, to make sure I didn't get it wrong. Um, and so, you, and you also get a nice, a nice graph with a gold line. It's like a gold star. But anyway, so um, and indeed, so that's what that's what that looks like. Um, so that was that was fun last night. All right, so that's if you have two groups, how to do a pairwise comparison. Survival group. Okay, so this is um, you know, so so that was basically. The t-test of survival analysis. Now we're on to the, the the linear model of survival analysis. Um, <clears throat> all right. So as I mentioned last week, I, I kind of was looking around at different books, and usually when when these models are presented, they talk about two different parametric models. They talk about an exponential model uh, and a Weibull or a Weibull model. Uh, and there's a, a variation on the Bible called the AFT, the Accelerated Failure Time Model, which uh, Accelerated Failure Time does sound like a nice title for my autobiography. Um, but, uh, but so in the book, they're not going to talk, they don't talk about those, so I'm also not going to talk about those. Um, everyone does end up talking about the Cox Proportional Hazards Model. And so that's the one that I'll spend the, the rest of the time talking about. And uh, as, as it is a semi-parametric semi model, uh, it makes fewer assumptions than the other two. Okay, so 
Okay, so it's called a proportional. So Cox is the guy's name, um, and it's called proportional hazards model. So like, so what are these things that are proportional? So there is a connection between this survival function that we've been talking about uh, up until now and this new thing called the hazard function, which is usually written h of t. Um, and we'll, we'll get there. We'll see the connection in a second. Um, but just so I just want to let you know that there is a connection. We're not talking about something completely new. Uh, so the hazard function is uh, an interesting is an interesting idea. It's the probability that some that the event happens. It could be death, uh, given that survival has happened up until that time. And if you were to leaf back in your books to the, when we created the Kaplan Meier estimate, you'll see that's actually the logic of the Kaplan Meier estimate too. That's what you're doing is you're calculating the probability of survival given uh, survival up until that time. So it's it's connected, um, but it's also different. And so this is, we get in a real jumble, a lot of functions of t here, a lot of functions of time, is that there also is a probability, just there's a, a PDF for this, the probability distribution function, just like there is for the, for the normal. So now we have basically our, our cumulative survival function, the PDF for death. And that, so it, it, yeah, so it, it, these things will confuse one. And, and so this is, this is, I promise this isn't actually as bad as it um, as it looks. Uh, it's actually just, there's some like little Bayesian manipulation going on here. So remember, so H of T, just to, I'll just go back for a second. I apologize if you were really getting into those equations. So it's the probability that an event happens at some time given survival up to that time. So um, I'm not gonna address the limit for just a second. Notice that it's the probability <clears throat> that our random variable t is between little t when we're evaluating and some small amount above above t right given that it is bigger than t so that's 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 what we have in the like when we verbally state what the hazard function is here it is written out and we're just limiting it as that interval as that window gets smaller and smaller so it's instantaneous <clears throat> All right, so here's the, the Bayes trick I mentioned. So a lot of you uh, uh, probably remember from in a probability class or the first few weeks of a statistics class um, that the probability of A given B can be written as the probability of A and B, so the joint distribution, but divided by the probability of B. So that's what happens here, is that we are saying, so this term becomes A, and so we say the probability of A and the probability of B, so the probability of A and B with this little intersection operator uh, divided by the probability of B. And um, just for writing it up here, I just, you'll see why, but the, the dividing by the, by delta T is going to move up top. Okay, and so now here's a, a clever thing that happens is that we can actually just drop uh, this part here, because if t is, you know, if it satisfies this condition that it's greater than t here, it trivially satisfies it here. So that's the difference between the second and third lines is that we're just dropping away um, the sort of what, what, I'm, what I was calling b, but the probability that t is greater than t. The probability that the random variable is bigger than the moment at which we're evaluating the function. And so now uh, we're left with this. And so this just uh, definitionally is the, the PDF. So it is, yeah, is the, P, the probability density function. And down below is the survival curve from last week. So this is the, you know, the connection. It's the force equals mass times acceleration of, of, of this thing. So it's kind of cool. I don't, um, to me, this is still, again, because as I mentioned last week, I don't, I don't really work with these. Uh, still, I don't look at this and feel like, oh man, now I just hazard functions. These are gonna become a part of my life. Like I, I haven't really just internalized it in that way, but the connections are, are nice. Anyway, um, okay. So so this is a hazard function. So like, what, what are we gonna, so far, if this, if this uh, presentation were to end now, I, I don't, it's like nothing you can go do yet with any of this. At least uh, that's how I feel. Um, okay, and this is going to be a bit hand wavy. Um, 
the book is a little bit hand wavy. I'm going to be a little bit more hand wavy. That's how these things go. Um, so it, I, I'm just going to mention um, that these models of being semi-parametric are going to be fit with what's called partial likelihood. So you know, if you if you run a, a for example a a uh, binomial a logit regression in R, you'll see that it's fitted with maximum likelihood and it'll give you some maximum likelihood statistics. In this case, um, these models are going to fit with maximizing the partial likelihood. And I'm not going to get into the details. I um, I just don't, I don't think it will help anyone understand. I mean, at a first pass, it's going to be like the most useful thing to understand. But so we can create a likelihood um, from this. So it's kind of a, a piecewise likelihood for each observation I. Um, like I said, I don't think it's super, like this is the thing to focus on. Um, is that, so, well, I'll do it part by part. Okay, so I thought this was a really excellent description from, again, this this um, Python library lifelines of, uh, of what it is. And so like you can look at the, the text and then look at the equation. And I guess I'll just do that with you all now. So the idea behind Cox's proportional hazards, hazard model is that the log hazard of an individual is a linear function of their covariates. OK, so notice here. So we have this linear function of covariates um, right there. So that just looks like an interceptless regression. And that's what it is. And and so it's being exponentiated. So you can, so its relationship to the actual function is going to be, it's going to be like logarithmic. Um, and so, right. So that's that's this part, and is that of covariates? And then there's a population baseline hazard that changes over time. And so that's this part. So there are just basically two factors in any given um, given individual. So you know this would be the individual's covariates. Uh, two factors in any individual's hazard function. And let's see. So um, kind of like basic, you know, linear regression. That if we set all of the regressors to zero, uh, what's going to happen is that we're going to exponentiate zero, which gives us uh, just the baseline function. And an interesting um, thing to note is that kind of like I found conflicting, I found a lot of conflicting statements about these models. So um, I think survival, when it, cal when it does, so calculating a baseline function is something they just say in the book, we're not going to do it. It's too complicated. Um, and it's, there's mention that, mention that it's often calculated with these, so the covariates being at their medians. I think that's how survival does it. So I will not accept any questions about, about centering variables. There seems to be a disagreement. In the book, they actually make a very specific statement about variables being set, having their true value at zero. And then I read survival documentation and maybe also lifelines documentation that talked about variables that centered variables. Um, so, so yeah, so, the, so there's some conflicting information there. Um, and you may have heard of things called relative risk. And so that's, that's what this is. That's what the exponentiated linear model is. Um, that is what relative risk is. And I'll see if I, Okay, so in this case, it's you know relative to uh, a person for whom or a unit for which uh, all the the variables are at zero. Um, so that's what that's what relative risk is. And I'll go through. We're gonna go through an example in a second. Um, okay, so proportional hazards assumption. Um, so. The, this is a big thing. They make a lot of, uh, ev everywhere, anytime you read about this, they'll talk about the proportional hazards assumption. 
And so the idea of a proportional hazards of the proportional hazards assumption is that the hazard function for groups A and B um, at any time are uh, just a constant at a, a yeah a constant different from each other. So the key thing is that notice that the C is not a function of time. So that if you were to plot this, I think hopefully that's my next point. Yeah, I'll get back to falls out of the equation in a second. But um, the visual check is that the, the two lines, if you were to plot these two lines, they can't cross at any given point because, you know, if, if they cross, that's definitely not differing by a constant because here, you know, you had, if, if B started higher, right, then it was some number greater, it was, you know, this number would be one point something, 1.1, 1 .1, or I mean, who knows, it could be two times high, as high. There's just some number greater than one. And then if it crosses, that would mean that now C is, is less than one. So it's definitely not a constant. Um, so that's usually what a book will say, but they really also can't have different shapes. Um, they have to have similar shapes um, if you're doing a visual check of the proportional hazards. Um, and another thing to mention is that, um, so this model has it in its name, um, but even models that don't have proportional hazards in their name assume the proportional hazards uh, relationship between different functions, or sorry, between, between hazard functions for two different groups. Um, and so I briefly, uh, I said that I'd get to this later, it falls out of the equation. So you'll see that um, this, this part, um, the part where we actually do the regression, that is time invariant. So that, that's the reason for that, is that, you know, in the, the next slide where I have it, I say like, you know, it's you're thinking of groups A and B, but we can also think of A and B as just two very similar covariate profiles where maybe one person, we have a continuous variable uh, on our, set of uh, regressors and like its age. And so this could be a, a could be a 31 year old and B could be a 32 year old, for example. Um, so it's, they don't have to be categorical groups. It's just the fact that this part, this linear model part um, is, is time invariant. So, so that's that. Okay. Um, so, so, okay. So how would we interpret one of these models? Okay, so say that, um, so, so one of the first uh, slides, which I won't, I won't scroll back to, uh, showed two different soil curves, one for men and one for women. So say that we, we, we run this regression in, in R, which is very, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and the only thing we do, uh, just like that, the plot where it's stratified on, on sex, was uh, we have a dummy for male, and we'll say we get so I just realized I'm about to say beta male, <laughs> which is a funny thing to say, uh, is 1.1. Um, so we can get a quantity called the hazard ratio where we exponentiate it and we get three. So- just, I'm sorry, uh, I just have to, I wanna offer your joke. YouTube's gonna recommend this video to some people and they're going to be very confused why it was recommended to them, but it was talking about beta males. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, does YouTube do speech? I I assume they do because they do automatic transcription. So why not use that in their uh, models? So anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, it's a shame that I feel like we could have got more views if I used alpha then. Well, yeah. <laughs> The varying intercepts it even would have made sense <laughs> but unfortunately it's we have we have beta male um all right i apologize to anyone who watches this in the future um so just in case um it's not immediately clear why this is being exponentiated like why is that a thing we're doing uh again it's just because when you get the output of the model the the quantities are going to need to be so so th so this is on you know this is a linear model but the way that it actually ultimately affects the, the hazard function we're interested in is 
after being exponentiated. So if you want to know on the scale of the outcome, uh, the effect of the coefficients, you'll you want to look at the their exponentiated versions. So that's why we're exponentiating. Okay. Uh, so it's approximately three. Um, and so, yeah, kind of did that there. So, um, so it's changed relative to baseline. So here again, so if, if the only thing we're, if the entire model is just regressing onto a dummy variable for sex, then you can say that the relative risk, now that we've calculated this, uh, for men over women is, is three. Okay, um, so there are two other ways that you can present these results. So there's something that I found called a hazards interpretation. So there you take the same quantity we calculated earlier, uh, you subtract one off of it and you get two. That's, that's some advanced math here. Um, and then you'll end up saying something like there is a 200% increase in hazards, which to me sounds terrifying. Um, so that's another way this is, these, are, these results are presented. And then there is a survival time uh, interpretation where now you take the reciprocal of this exponentiated coefficient, subtract one off. Again, some advanced mathematics here. Uh, you get negative two thirds. And so this is useful because now we're getting a negative sign. So you see uh, that what we're going to say is the negative sign translates into decrease. Uh, so a decrease in survival time. So it's a little bit ambiguous. It's, well, yeah. Um, but so, so these are the ways these results will often be presented. So you just have coefficients. It's a very similar situation actually to, uh, you know, when you do a logistic regression, you have different ways of presenting things. Or if you have a linear log model, uh, so if you have logged coefficients in your, well, I don't know, I won't get into other models. That's not, so anyway, this is actually, I think where my presentation ends because I thought this was the, meat of the issue. So, um, so yeah, so these are, this is the basics of survival models. The 200% increase in hazards uh, reminded me of a Twitter account I had to go find this, uh, just say risks, where whenever someone's posting about a scientific paper where they're saying, you know, the relative risk increased by 28 times and they tweet pointing out that that's an absolute risk increase of 0.01 percent or whatever like <laughs> absolute risk or the relative risk increase can be huge and not actually be huge anyway yeah yeah so <laughs> yes if, if, the, if the baseline if the baseline is very small then the relative risk uh i mean the relative risk is the relative risk but yeah right. yep cool <laughs> All right, just say risk. I will I will follow them. 